This is Pacific Reach. All members are encouraged to build close relationship with their neighbors and their friends. Lead them to know Jesus and plant new churches where people live. Early this year, we started a new church plant at Wairamidia. Church members started visiting homes around the new church plant. My name is Simeli Ratkolo and I'm an engineer. My name is Josephine Ratkolo and I am a school teacher. I remember one time he was telling me about, um, about having a church plant at our house. I was thinking of all the responsibilities that will come with it. I, I prayed a lot about it and I, and I said, okay, Simeli, we can have a church plant. We discovered that we had non-attending church members near our place. We invited them to come and be part of our church plant, and they were willing to come. So we started our church plant eight months ago. The chief method of evangelism we are employing in our church plant is to visit our neighbors and community in their homes. Pastor told me that God created my two feet to take the word of God to my community. We visited all the houses around here by walking. We walked so many miles to visit people in our community. They received me, I went inside, I shared the Bible with them, I pray with them, and I asked the Lord to bless them. And the door is always open for me. And I'm telling my wife, you know, we are building this uh, relationship. I feel that I have so much a part to play in their life, in a way that I have influenced them through God's love and uh, providence. To have a church plant in your homes, uh, it brings us very close with other church members. Uh, we have that uh, close bonding. The, now we become one family. I feel that the Lord has a call for me to win souls to his kingdom. A sinner like myself, eh? they will also may have a chance if you go out to their homes and share the good news to them, that they will also be part of the kingdom. Six-year-old Joanna wrinkled her little nose at the food that mother had placed on the table for supper. I want to be clever, she announced. I don't want to eat meat. Mother gasped in surprise. She had worked hard to prepare the traditional Botswanan meal in their home in Francistown, the second largest city in Botswana. She had set the table with beef stew, a maize porridge that resembles mashed potatoes, and bean leaves that look like spinach. Mother thought quickly. Is that what you're being taught at school? She asked. Yes, Joanna said. The pastor told us not to eat the wrong food. We should eat the right food so we can be clever. Mother asked more questions and learned that a week of prayer had just begun at Eastern Gate Primary School, where Joanna was studying in the first grade. The theme for the week of prayer was Daniel. 
That morning, the school pastor had described how Daniel and his three friends had refused to eat meat in King Nebuchadnezzar's palace in Babylon. Instead, they had eaten vegetables and become wise, strong men. You aren't supposed to eat this meat, only vegetables, Joanna told Mother, pointing to the beef stew. I want to be clever, like Daniel. Mother remembered hearing about the benefits of a vegetarian diet. Somehow she hadn't gotten around to trying it. But she felt happy that Joanna was learning about eating healthy food at her school. Okay, I will do my best to cook the right food, Mother said. Joanna happily ate the maize porridge and bean leaves for supper. She didn't touch the beef stew. The next day, Mother went to the kitchen to prepare supper and remembered her daughter's desire to avoid meat. So she told Joanna's father and her 16-year-old brother that she wouldn't cook any meat for the rest of the week while Joanna learned about Daniel. Joanna's brother grumbled, but he finally agreed to eat the vegetables. Joanna was so happy. Every supper, she ate vegetables and other food without meat. Nine months have passed since that special week. Joanna still prefers vegetables, and Mother is trying to cook healthy meals without meat. Joanna believes that she made the right choice in following Daniel's example. The principal at Joanna's school agreed. Joanna is now at the top of her class, and the principal thinks this is because of her healthy meals and her faith that God will reward her choice. When you eat vegetables, you become strong and healthy. Joanna is learning valuable lessons at her school. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering in 2015, which helped pay for the construction of Joanna's school, Eastern Gate Primary School. It is the first Seventh-day Adventist primary school in northern Botswana and the third in the country. Beloved members of the British Columbia Conference, it's my privilege to introduce to you our conference's video for this month. David Haluska will share with us some amazing blessings that we experienced in our ABC last year. I'm sure your heart will be touched. Early last year, I didn't take the coronavirus very seriously. I'm not sure many people did, at least not in North America. When March came, the rumblings got louder, but our bookmobile was still packed and ready to run. The day it was to leave, I was told the semi-truck had to be canceled. I was quite frustrated. The weeks of work to get the truck ready, the anticipation from our customers who had waited over a year for the runs to start back up, and then having to undo all those preparations, it was discouraging. But it got worse. The hammer fell when Camp Hope Camp Meeting was announced that it would be canceled. The ABC is divided up into three business sections. First, the ABC store in Abbotsford, then the bookmobile, and finally the store business at Camp Meeting. Roughly one third of our business comes from each of these segments. Financially, the ABC would have to function on only one third of those profit centers. The question wasn't if we were in financial trouble, it was 
how bad it would be. And then I got a phone call. It was Ed Lindsay. Ed's a retired manager who spent his life in ABC work. He contacted me to send encouragement and asked how things looked, and I told him what he already suspected. With a canceled bookmobile and no usual camp meeting sales, he knew all too well the forecast was gloomy. He gave me a suggestion, why don't you run a small van? Make the orders prepaid and just bring the items and drop them in the parking lot. It would not be what the bookmobile was capable of, but it might replace some of those losses. And so it sounded like a good idea. After crunching the numbers and working out the logistics, our bookmobile driver, Johnson, made a delivery schedule and arranged for the rental vehicle. Each location centered around the regular bookmobile stops, but it focused on speedy delivery and departure. Every set of runs was kept to just two days. Some stops were only 15 minutes per location. This model heavily relied on customers being willing to adjust their schedules to meet us when and where we dictated, whether in the middle of a workday or in the dark of night. But as Ed had predicted, the runs were met with satisfaction and even delight by our customers. During the year, we made some adjustments, but overall, the Lord really blessed us. We're grateful to the Lord for His mercy. We had wonderful support from our church and school organizations all across the conference. The generosity and flexibility from everyone has been undeserved. There's an old song lyric that goes, count your blessings, name them one by one. I was blessed to get the call from, from Ed. Our driver was sustained over hundreds of hours spent on the roads. We received clarity of thought while we were juggling the thousands of orders that came in. And as we pulled and prepared each item for delivery, God provided the dedicated staff we needed to respond to every inquiry, even though it sometimes took the staff many hours after closing. It was a whirlwind year, but it was one where the Lord was leading and working through it all. And how did it end? The most unexpected blessing of all. The Treasury Department says we ended 2020 in the black, financially solvent. One year ago, it seemed an impossibility, but with God, all things are possible. You see how God works? When this pandemic started, we had no idea how things would turn out. The ABC lost two-thirds of its normal income, the bookmobile and the in-person camp meeting. We are seriously concerned how things would be with the ABC. But God has a better plan. He was there to test our faith. And we prayed and we put the ABC in our lives and every segment of the church in His hands. And He blessed us tremendously last year. I just finished a conversation with David Halaska, our ABC manager, and he told me that we sold more Bibles last year than many years in the past, and more books, especially about the final events on this earth. My dear brother, my dear sister, God wants us to depend on Him more and more every day. Our lives and His work are in His hands. May God bless you richly, and may the year of 2021 be a blessing for you and your family and your church and everything that we do together to expand God's kingdom in the British Columbia Conference. May God bless you richly. Don't put 
push me away Ashamed and afraid I know who you are and I love you anyway My child So bring me all your wants and needs Desperate one cannot exceed my care for you And bring me all your doubts and fears The hurt you haven't faced in years The wounded heart you've stuffed inside The tears you've tried so hard to hide And come weary child Rest beside me for a while So come to me just the way you are Though you've fallen hard and wandered far Stop trying to be so brave, so strong It's okay to cry, child Tears on the wrong So come weary, child Rest beside me for a while I know your care Thank you.
the apocalypse. Unfortunately, many people today are associating apocalypse with some nuclear disaster, some major catastrophe. And uh, much of today's Hollywood and uh, even in the secular world, the word apocalypse brings very negative connotations. But would you be surprised to know that the word apocalypse is a beautiful word it actually doesn't carry any of the meanings that today's world is trying to portray the word apocalypse simply means revelation that's right it means to reveal that which is hidden that's why the final book of the Bible is called revelation and you may ask revelation of what and the Bible in the very first sentence of the book of Revelation declares that apocalypse is all about Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible proclaims him as the Lord and the King of Kings and the Alpha and Omega. And we're just going to get to that right away. But I would like to also say that apocalypse, unfortunately, has also been associated with many uh, unstable people, even within Christianity. And some of you who may be watching this program, you may think, well, is this another is this another video of some crazy uh, apocalyptic uh, preacher that is going to say some crazy things? Because there's a lot of crazy things that have been said by some people, like David Koresh in the United States, like Shoko Asahara uh, in Japan. We know that uh, all these mystics who still rush even to Jerusalem to find the Messiah or to be one, uh, the concept of apocalypse, unfortunately, has inspired many people, many unstable people, and even greater delirium. And the Bible warns us, the Bible actually says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse six, verses 16 to 18, it says that the Bible contains some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do to other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless man and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Once again, it's all about Jesus Christ. And when, when you get to know him, a Christian is someone who is going to be the most stable and the most balanced person, I believe. That's why today I'm presenting the apocalypse. And so, friends, are you ready? Are you willing to be stable and, and balanced and sober-minded? Because that's very important for the book of Revelation, for the study of the apocalypse. Because if you don't think that you are stable or maybe you're struggling with certain things i would like to encourage you to still stay with us because you will see that the book of revelation is a beautiful book uh, speaking peace bringing peace to people's hearts and to people's minds to make us more stable to fill us with faith that's why in the book of revelation chapter 1 verse 8 it says that the, the apocalypse is about Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I would like to state that the Bible makes no apology to call Jesus the Almighty God. This title is already mentioned in the book of Isaiah, that Messiah will be called the Almighty God the everlasting father yes we can call Jesus our father and here in the book of Revelation it calls Jesus the Almighty which is one of the most ancient names for God he is the beginning and the end this awesome amazing creator came down to this world and this final book is all about him not about the disasters and calamities even though the Bible also uh, does not promise us Christians or those who believe in God that we will have an easy life. No, we are part of the great controversy. But the victor is Jesus. And this book is all about Him. And the Bible promises us that if we read this book, we will be blessed. 
and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near friends the time is near already in verse 3 the Bible says that the time is near when Jesus will come again and in the first verse it says it's revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place so yes it's the book of prophecy and in order for us to understand this prophetic book we will take uh, just a little introduction to the book of Revelation because this book compared to all other books in the Bible is more Hebrew than any other book of the New Testament in particular it contains more than 2,000 allusions to the Hebrew scriptures 400 explicit references to Pentateuch and the prophets 90 literal citations of the Pentateuch and the prophets 90 literal citations so friends if you think that God has done away with the Old Testament you will not be able to understand the book of Revelation because it has explicit citation word for word and if you also were to look at uh, the entire book of Revelation you will also realize that the author structured this book as uh, in a sevenfold pattern in a menorah structure as the scholars say it unwinds in seven cycles of visions at the beginning of each of the seven cycles the vision returns to the temple it alludes to the calendar of Israel's high holy days as prescribed in Levit Leviticus chapter 23 it places each prophetic cycle within the perspective of a Jewish festival so in order to understand the book of Revelation it's important to understand the Jewish festivals and what they meant because they tell the story of salvation they teach us of how God saves us and John invites us to read the Apocalypse in the light of the Jewish festivals that shed symbolic meaning on history and there if you were to summarize you can see these seven major holidays that are still observed by our Jewish brothers and sisters and the book of Revelation capitalizes on this imagery it talks about the Passover uh, it talks about the Kippur and these symbols that we can see in the seven churches seven seals seven trumpets seven signs seven cups seven victories seven wonders and that's why even this church that I represent today is called the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We believe that the number seven is very, very dear and close to, to God. It's a symbol of perfection. And even He created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. So that you and I are not an accident. God created us. That's why we believe in the Sabbath and keeping of the Sabbath. You know, um, the book of Revelation speaks about the plan of salvation. And it starts in chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Jesus says, I am who I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So here in Revelation 1:18, already we have an introduction to the Passover, because the Passover. If you go back to the Old Testament, it's all about the death of the Lamb for our sins. And that's why the doorposts of this uh, uh, in Egypt, when uh, the final plague was coming to Egypt, and the final destruction in this world will come, folks, of all, all the evil will be destroyed. The Bible speaks of that. But if we mark our hearts with the blood of the Lamb, if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that final plague, which is the second death, will have no strength over us. And that's why the book of Exodus and the Passover reminds us that Jesus Christ is just about to perform something that is unusual. He's going to put an end to all the evil. And if you do not have the blood of the Lamb, we will simply not survive because that will mean that we have not chosen him as our Lord and Savior and what's amazing about uh, salvation and about Passover what we can learn from it is that the Lord did not check who inside the house was worthy he checked for the blood of the lamb on the doorposts because none of us are worthy none of us 
That's why when you come to the Apocalypse, the book is inviting us to come in complete humility before Him. You cannot save yourself. Jesus Christ, the Almighty, He is our Lord and Savior. And there is no other name by which we can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's why, just like in the Passover, this plague passed over, Jesus protected His people, and so the first prophecy in the book of Revelation starts with Jesus Christ walking among the seven candlesticks and seven stars. And he tells us what this is all about. He says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So you see, folks, the Bible interprets itself. The first prophecy is about the Passover. The first prophecy is about Jesus Christ. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So we are not afraid of anything that is described in the Bible in terms of plagues that are coming on this planet. And yes, they are coming. Yes, the plagues are the consequences of people's rebellion against God. And frankly speaking, folks, in 2021, this pandemic and all the news, uh, devastation, economy, everything that is happening all around us, if you really look down deep inside humanity, you can see that we are reaping the consequences of our rebellion. We have rebelled against God's laws, God's laws of health, God's commandments of being good stewards. We have destroyed, we are still continuing to destroy our planet with how we live and how we behave. But God says, don't worry, <laughs> I am here. I am the one who lives, who was dead, and behold, I am, still, I am still alive. And so these seven churches, if you look, you can see that they are in Asia Minor, in modern day in Turkey. And um, what's interesting is that when scholars look, look back in the history of Christianity, they realize that back in the days of John, the revelator who wrote the book of Revelation, there were definitely many more churches than just seven churches. So obviously we realize, the biblical scholars realize that there is much more to this. It's a symbolic. And then they paid close attention to the names of these seven churches. And, and these are the Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And then scholars realized by studying Greek, they realized that these names, these cities, they actually mean something. And... Uh, and they stand for particular time periods because now as we look back and we look at the history of Christianity, we will realize that these seven churches, which are in Asia, but they were used symbolically because there were many more churches even in Asia than just seven. But God specifically picked these names. And you will be amazed. Just stay with us here. You will see how they fit beautifully the predictions of entire Christian history. The first church is called Ephesus and uh, literally it means desirable and today's scholars believe that this desirable church started from the time of christ to about 100 a.d these are the first christians and uh, the bible has a lot of good things to say about them and god says i know your works you your labor your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil revelation 2 2 at the same time, we know that if you travel back in time in Ephesus, in this great city, many citizens, they worshipped entertainment. They had many uh, large theaters. In Ephesus, theater accommodated 24,000 people. They also worshipped power. Uh, even now, if you go to Ephesus, you will find a library in honor of Roman governor of Asia, Julius Celsus. And you will realize that there in Ephesus, they had a 24-foot statue of Emperor Domitian, who proclaimed himself as Lord and God. Imagine the peer pressure from, from the public for on all the Christians to worship these, these men. Uh, there was all kinds of temples in, the, in Ephesus. And um, another distraction for many people was that sexual promiscuity was rampant in uh, Ephesus. People literally worshipped sexual desires. 
They even had a, a temple, Artemis or Diana, goddess of fertility. They also had false teachers called Nicolaitans, who portrayed themselves as Christians, but they brought these very unbiblical doctrines. So folks, it is very important to know that uh, falsehood was already even back a problem back in the in the Bible times. As the Bible says, unstable people can misquote the Bible to their own destruction. Nicolaitans actually developed this uh, this uh, pagan uh, ideology that your body is made up of dualistic uh, realities where your spirit is separate from your body, which is totally unbiblical. And we will discuss this more in the future. But they believe that your spirit is always pure and whatever you do to your body doesn't matter. So some of them were involved in a sexual promiscuity they would say well that, that's nothing because my spirit is clean but it doesn't matter what how i live it doesn't matter how i live my life or what i practice because my spirit is pure and god actually uses very strong la language to say that i hate what nicolaitans do and so they had false teachers and uh, in the book of acts chapter 20 verses 29 to 30 it says, for I know this, and this was 50 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. Already there, we know the, the prediction that was made. It says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And who are these savage wolves? Well, they are from among yourselves. Man will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. There is the prescription for all the instability that sometimes you see in their religion. And the Bible actually uh, identifies these things. These false prophets, they will not come from another religion. They will come, the most dangerous offshoot that can happen is from within Christianity. And this is the most devastating tactic that the devil has used against his church is to raise these people from among yourselves speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples and that's the main thing a lot of these things uh, a lot of these people on YouTube that sometimes make sensationalistic proclamations sometimes they are doing this only for one reason only and that is to draw disciples after themselves to be popular, to be famous, to say things that will, uh, you know, to people who have itchy ears, they like something that is exciting. And so people have all kinds of even conspiracies. And the same thing was back in the days of disciples, back in the day of Jesus. But nobody wanted to drink the pure water of Christ. Sometimes I meet people who say, come on, pastor, you, you've got to be deeper than this. This is water to me. And my response is, really? You want to drink spiritual Pepsi and Coke? You don't want to drink water? Well, guess what? The Bible is using water as the symbol of God's truth. That's simple water, not Coke. Coke excites you, but it's not good for you. And so the book of Revelation reminds us that already in the first phase of Christian history, there were teachers who were false teachers. And nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love, the Bible says, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And what is the solution? The Bible says, repent and do the first works. And do you know what repent means, folks? Complete turnaround, a complete U-turn in how you live your life. Oh, there are so many of us who are watching this uh, telecast right now. You know that God wants you to make a complete U-turn and you know that you need to do it. And the reason you don't want to do it because you know it will cost you something. That means to change your lifestyle. And that was the solution to the people who lived in the first phase of Christian history. But you know the prophecy continues. The second church out of the seven churches is, is Smyrna. And the name itself is also symbolic. It actually means myrrh or the balm of death. And this is the church that was, uh, today historians, uh, they labeled this time period from 100 AD to 323 AD. And this is the only, one of the only two churches that God actually praises 
out of the seven churches without mentioning anything negative about them. Smyrna is one of the purest churches, and I'll tell you why. Those of you who know Christian history, you do realize of what happened during 100 AD to 323 AD. The church was persecuted. And yes, there were some major uh, problems in terms of even teaching. There was Gnostics who believed in mysticism and secret knowledge. And there was this Marcion who rejected, rejected the Old Testament and everything that was Jewish. But this was the time when the biblical canon was formed. That's why we have 66 books in the Bible. It was during this time that Christians responded, especially to Marcion, another false teacher, who simply decided to get rid of the Old Testament and to get rid of all the New Testament books that had some kind of Jewish hint. You can say he was one of the first people, one of the first Christians that literally hated every, everything Jewish. Even though today the Bible reminds us, including the Apocalypse, that our Jewish brothers and sisters are not our enemies, they're our friends. And even Jesus Christ, when he came to this planet, he chose to be born in the Jewish family, to a Jewish mother and a Jewish father. Christians already back in the in 100 to 323 AD, they already were making some mistakes of trying to separate themselves from the Jewish people completely. And the same thing also happens to some of the Jewish folks as well, who tried to separate themselves from Christianity. But we are not enemies, we are brothers and sisters. And so Christians responded, not with violence. Unfortunately, so often we know that people who have religious zeal, they respond with violence. And we can see that the Bible predicted that. But Christians' response was formation of biblical canon. Furthermore, the Bible says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And this speaks to us. We think that today we are going through much suffering. And don't get me wrong. I know there, we had a lot of people who passed away from COVID-19 in every country. Uh, including in, um, among my relatives, uh, people who have passed away from this terrible disease. And some people are feeling the consequences of, you know, loss of business, loss of income, loss of employment. And the Bible says, when you go through tribulations, rejoice, because God is with you more than ever. He is closer to you than any other time. And he says, I know your works, you feel that you are very poor, but guess what? You are very rich and wealthy. And so be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Oh, beautiful words for people who go through difficulties. You know, the church of Smyrna was persecuted. But the Bible says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. And you will have tribulation for 10 days. And just like the Bible predicted, because one day symbolically stands for one year. And we can find this in Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. But just like the Bible predicted, we know that the most severe persecution happened uh, in the uh, Roman Empire from 303 AD under the Emperor Diocletian until Galerius, who finally was replaced by Constantine in 313. But what's interesting is that this 10-day tribulation that was described and that is already in the history of our Christian history, we know that uh, number 10 is also symbolic in the Bible. Number, number 10 is a symbol of trial and testing. And uh, in Daniel, 10-day trial, for example, in Daniel chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. 10 days also separate Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, from Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now you understand why we have trumpets, the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. Once again, we are going back to those Jewish holidays that will teach us the symbolism of what this, is, this means. The Bible can interpret itself. And so 10 days and 10 generations from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Abraham. And then, of course, we know that there were 10 plagues of Egypt. So number 10 is a symbol of trial and testing. And God's people are not exempt from it. 
God's people are not exempt from getting sick with coronavirus or getting exempt from sometimes even the violence that this world has to throw on us. Just remember, even Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of a violent mob, but he blessed them. He did not rally the government to, for weapons, for more guns. It really breaks my heart that many Christians today believe that somehow freedom is about having your own gun. And don't get me wrong, I, I know that these are strange times, but uh, I can tell you that it's not the guns that are going to bring peace to your country. But it's going to be that attitude that Jesus had, who said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's true Christianity. And unfortunately today, many people are not even, are even leaving the church because they are just embarrassed of many Christians just standing up for guns, standing up for things that are, have nothing to do with the Bible. God does not guarantee that we will have an easy life, but He guarantees that He will be with us. And that is the most important because Christians are not afraid of difficult days. And so the most severe persecution lasted from 303 to 313 AD. And I have this short video clip that you see right now on your screens. And this video clip portrays those early Christians who lived in this most difficult time period that was predicted in the book of Revelation. And you know, the world was not worthy of these wonderful Christians. They were thrown into the Colosseums in front of thousands of people to me to be made fun of but those are early christians instead of guns they had the most powerful message the most powerful message that is described in the bible which is the word of god and today when we read the historical accounts of christians you know being thrown to the lions being tortured in in public many people today scholars find that many of those spectators became Christian because because how those early Christians behaved themselves instead of cursing their enemies they blessed them instead of searching for weapons they simply remember the words of Jesus and simply said Lord forgive them for what they are doing. Some of them were simply singing hymns, singing songs, but they gave the most powerful testimony the world has ever seen. And that is the testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. So the apocalypse does not spare us from suffering, but the apocalypse promises that we will have Jesus always with us because he is walking among the seven candlesticks.